Left to rot on the steps of the cathedral, blood boiling in the morning sun, white silk stained by years of running, fingers cut and bruised by the dishonor of others, a pound of flesh for Jesus, weighed in mojo bags by beggars and thieves. The Egyptians believed the most important thing you could do in your life was die, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Akhenaten standing righteous in a hollow tomb, the boy king deceived by high priests, sodomized and murdered by sick belief. Nothing new under the sun. Wisdom cannot be tested against ignorance and greed. So the towers fall one by one, as I burn here praying on the steps of the cathedral to a god known by none. Fists clenched after hours in a fugue state, where too many things left unsaid become distilled into a handful of scenarios where you reap what you've sown, as I flail majestically in an undertow of stupidity. Do they sell you paradise? Do they sell you fairies with butter knives? No, 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 no. They sold us happiness, giggles in Central Park, hand in hand, walked John and Thomas, Thomas licked and licked. They sold us easiness, numb tranquility, passive abundance. This is all that. This is all that. I still think of honey in paradise, liquor without hangovers. There is also a door to hell. What happens here? Inside they burn and burn, but I hear they bribe the gas guy. So they burn when he sees otherwise it's a deal there too. This is what you said is equal to sin. What sin do you talk about? I walked barefoot in dusty towns. I walked finding my shoes and still and still and still I burn. So a deal was all I did. A deal was all I got. And, and, and. You know what? There's a system there too, there too, there too, where stuff happens. Leverages happen, and to satisfy myself, I have termed them divine leverages. All right, all right, all right. Did you see your neighbor's pus? Did you see their elbows flying in the sky? Yes, I saw all of that, and they too saw all of that. We were passengers of fire, and nothing, and nothing more. So fuck off with your intellect and go to Peru tracing Mayans. Ask them what fire means to them. Laugh it off, laugh it off, laugh it off. Because now you can only laugh it off. To lie beautifully, kind of. I mean, no one really talks like that. Do you know how long it takes to get the rhythm right? Sometimes countless hours spent formulating thoughts, pushing the dust of fragmented ideas into a mold consisting of 26 letters, and then put out into the world with a sincere hope that the one person who reads it will understand the intention, or maybe have something to add, and that idea that was once just gaseous in many minds as a liquid ironclad. And he sits in a dark room at a desk, going on midnight with work in the morning, trying like hell to create something, working out in his own heart the meaning of his thoughts, using definitions that he knows to shape them into clumps and put them on the screen for you to see and hopefully enjoy. The way a poem looks and seems and makes you feel as though you met him through his words. I set my bags down on the threshold and breathed in deeply. This was my home, only mine, for the entire month of June. Realizing my lifelong dream of being an actual published author of a work of fiction had been a dizzying world of deadlines, promotional tactics, emails, and a swiftly filling social calendar. In the wake of all this, I had decided to take a portion of my earnings to run away. I needed time to let this all sink in, to appreciate this life goal being met, to get my bearings for the next idea. I wasn't even planning to do any writing. I just needed space to remember who I was. 
And so, here I was, suspended by a bridge to my very own treehouse villa, rented for a full month, no family or friends allowed. I smiled to myself and stepped through the door. Amidst the hushed symphony of winter's breath, the small town lay enshrouded in a quilt of snow. Each building bore a weighty cloak of white, their shapes softened and rounded by the touch of frost. The air itself seemed to hold its breath, as if afraid to disturb the ethereal beauty that the season had woven. City Hall, standing as a bastion of history and memory, cast a long shadow across the icy path that led to its back. It was here, where the hidden stories often find their home, that fate cast its mournful dice. It was a night veiled in starlight and sorrow that I found myself wandering behind the grand edifice, my breath a ghostly wisp in the frigid air. There amidst the quiet murmur of snowflakes settling lay a sight that would forever etch itself upon my soul. A lifeless form, clad in the stillness of death, rested upon the frozen ground. The snow around it seemed to cradle it, as if the earth itself offered solace to the departed soul. The face, once kissed by life's colors, now bore the pale touch of winter's grip. The cheeks, once flushed with vitality, now held the ashen hue of memories fading away. But it was the expression that captured my gaze, an enigmatic blend of peace and longing. The eyes, clouded with the weight of eternity, seemed to beckon me to understand the journey that led to this tragic repose. Was it pain that etched those lines upon the forehead, or the shadow of a forgotten smile? With the tenderness born from a heart heavy with empathy, I extended my hand, fingers trembling to stroke the cold cheek. The frigid touch of the corpse's skin sent a shiver coursing through my spine, a stark reminder of the divide between life and death. Yet, in that moment, I could almost feel a faint echo of warmth, as if my gesture was a bridge between the living and the departed. But as swiftly as a candle snuffed by the wind, the bitter cold clung to my hand, gnawing at my flesh. Frostbite, the cruel companion of winter's embrace, spread its icy tendrils, leaving a mark of its own upon me. It was as if the very act of seeking to comfort the lifeless form exacted its toll a price paid for daring to defy the rules of existence. Seated by the side of this silent companion, I offered my own fragile warmth. I whispered words to the stillness, words of comfort. The stars above bore witness to the somber vigil, their distant light casting a celestial glow upon the scene. In the quiet hours of night, there was a strange communion, a shared moment between the living and the departed. As the night wore on and the moon's ascent marked the passage of time, I could feel the cold seeping into my bones, merging with the chill of the frozen ground beneath me. Yet, I remained steadfast by the side of the fallen soul, as if our shared vulnerability bound us together. The stars above shimmered with another worldly light. I could feel my own heart slowing, my breath growing shallow. The boundary between life and death blurred, and I felt myself slipping away, my consciousness dissipating like a snowflake in the wind. In that moment, there was no fear, no regret. There was only a sense of serenity, a feeling of unity with the world around me. I closed my eyes, and the cold no longer stung. Instead, it cradled me, embraced me, as if welcoming me into its icy embrace. And so, I died that night. I died. I died. I died. Not with a sense of finality, but with a profound understanding of the beauty and fragility of existence. Morning's light arrived as a silent herald, its soft touch brushing away the darkness. It was a tableau frozen in time, two figures locked in their silent embrace, untouched by the dawning sun. The town's constables arrived, their footsteps echoing with a solemn rhythm. Their eyes held a mixture of pity and reverence as they surveyed the scene before them. In their gaze, I saw the realization dawn, a connection forged in the throes of an unforgiving winter night, a gesture of solace given, and a shared fate met. 
With gentle hands, they carried us from that place, two souls united by the cold hands of death. As the pages of time turned, the memory of that fateful night became a part of the town's very essence. It became woven into the fabric of its existence. Every winter, when the snow blanketed the world in its icy embrace, the townsfolk would remember the stranger who had come to sit by the corpse's side. The years went by and the town changed. New faces appeared and old ones departed. Yet the story remained, a testament to the enduring power of the mysteries that lie beyond the veil of life and death. As the news spread, the town mourned the loss of the stranger who had sought to comfort the departed. The grandeur of City Hall seemed to pale in comparison to the enigmatic tale that had unfolded in its shadow. And so, dear reader, as you walk the streets of that small town in the middle of winter, remember the story of the stranger and the departed. Let their tale remind you that even in the face of death's icy grasp, compassion and human connection can transcend the boundaries of the ordinary leaving an imprint that lingers long after the snow has melted and the seasons have changed. There are no strangers in death. <laughs>